and welcome. My name is uh, Chantal Bilodeau. I am the co-curator for The Green Rooms, uh, and I'm very happy to um, have you attend this event, both on the live stream and people who are in the rooms with us, in the room with us. Uh, today is uh, the second day of The Green Rooms, and we are now on our third session today. Uh, and I really need to mention that The Green Rooms is produced by English Theatre at the National Arts Centre and presented by FOLDA uh, in collaboration with the Canada Council for the Arts, the City of Kingston, the National Theatre School and HowlRound Theatre Commons. And I am very happy to, um, oh, actually, before we start, I would like to acknowledge that uh, Mission Control would, for this event is located in Kingston, Ontario, which is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee and the huron wendat Kingston is covered by Treaty 57 and the territory was acquired in 1783 in Crawford's Purchase. Uh, and now I would like to introduce you to uh, Sarah Garten Stanley, who is actually my co-curator on this event, for this event, and she's a director. And she's going to be in conversation with Ravi Jain, who is a stage director known for making politically bold and accessible theatrical experiences in both small indie productions and large stages. Sarah and Ravi are going to talk about leadership and structures for change. And please feel free to use the chat to comment along the way. Now to you. Thanks, Chantal. Ravi, I can't quite hear you. I'm on mute again. I did, I did the Zoom classic, <laughs> classic Zoom entrance. <laughs> Hi, Sarah, how are you? I'm okay, I'm okay. It's I, nice to see I, you. Nice to see you. I didn't get to actually say hi behind the, the television studio of this moment. Um, very nice to see you. Thank you, Chantel. Um, so I, I just would love to start by saying, you know, um, this whole conversation has been reframed um, thanks to Sarah and the team. Um, you know, uh, I'm also going to say I'm really nervous right now. Uh, it's been hard to have these conversations and to to be in this virtual space and not have eye contact with folks is very strange in this moment. Um, but I will say, so uh, the original topic had three panel, four panelists, um, two colleagues from Canada and one from the UK. And we were talking about structural change in regards to climate and given all that's happening um, in particular right now with the Black Lives Matter movement um, and all the conversations around white supremacy in the arts, um, I was really struggling with how to have this conversation in an authentic way and uh, how do we how do we do this right now? How do we talk and how do we listen? And um, uh, at a certain point, um, uh, my colleague Wayne was unable to attend and then all of a sudden here I was on a panel with a bunch of white folks and uh, not feeling very comfortable about that. And graciously, Sarah engaged with the problem and we had a number of hopeless back and forth emails um, and then it turned into us saying, let's just have a conversation. Sarah and I are good friends. We've talked a lot about these conversations around white supremacy and making change from the inside and from the outside of institutions and the challenges of that. And so um, I'm just really grateful for the team to have uh, pivoted like that. And Sarah, for you to engage in this conversation, um, I'm really grateful for it. And, and to the audience of unknown folks out there, um, you know, uh, I feel like uh, I proposed a loose structure to Sarah that we'll just have a conversation and we'll cover racism, we'll cover climate and we'll cover leadership, which essentially was the proposal in the first place. Um, and Sarah, I just love for us to talk. Like I haven't seen you and spoken to you and are so many, as we said, so many of our conversations have been about exactly this um, and the pain of it and, and the difficulties of how to move things forward honestly in this moment um, that is filled right now with so much pain and so much truth. And I'll lead by saying my, my biggest fear right now is nothing's going to happen. And I've been so hopeless <laughs> uh, in the last couple of days. And uh, it's been really, um, it's challenging to, to, uh, to face. So, I feel like I'm, I'm excited for this conversation because it will just allow a moment of 
listening and real listening, not this bullshit listening that I feel is happening, which we'll talk about. Um, so thank you again, I guess. I don't know, kick off. Uh, you know, I, I propose that I wanted to describe you, actually. I wanted to do your bio, um, but I guess we can move on from that. I mean, I mean we met. How we met, uh, I was going to mention Banff. I don't know. Uh, this conversation uh, happened also because you and I met at Banff. Uh, you brought me to Banff. You invited me to Banff with your third cycle, the NAC cycles, um, that you've um, ferociously spearheaded. Um, for those who don't know, the first was indigeneity, which out of that conversation came the NAC's indigenous, um, what do you call it, wing? Uh, theater, theater department. The theater yeah. department. Yeah. Then accessibility and then climate. And, and in the climate conversation too, we had conversations about race <laughs> and, um, and the difficulty of that. So I don't know, uh, do you want to say anything? Sure. I mean, you know, I, I've thought a lot about, uh, first of all, Ravi and I have known each other for much longer than, than that, um, than last year in April when we gathered with a number of scientists and um, artists, um, thinkers, fantastic leaders, just to talk about, uh, to learn about some of the real specifics around this question. Um, and it was uh, an enlivening and terrifying and very rich and rewarding, I think, intersection for a lot of people. But I, I've thought a lot about my opening remarks and how I spoke um, about how this final cycle was uh, something that uh, portends to everybody. The lived experience of climate is something that no one is free from. And I really feel that that in one way factually is true, but in another way, it it's a position that I, uh, that I understand continues to speak to a kind of an inherent problem, which is to say, like, when COVID started, it was like the great equalizer. And it's like, very soon after, it's like, no, it's not actually equal. It's very, very different. And, and the same is, is absolutely true when it comes to climate, which Jennifer pointed out previously, which the speakers who just came before us have spoken about, which many of the speakers last night um, have been highlighting, is that it's not... Uh, <laughs> It's not an equal problem. It's a, it is an issue for everybody. And yet there are certain people who benefit, as Noam Chomsky would say, there's certain people who are benefiting from the problems of some of these situations as opposed to um, being interested in the solutions. So, uh, you know, to have this conversation with you, Ravi, is, um, is yeah, I'm, I'm nervous too. And I think, why is it that we are so uncertain around one another? Um, what are the conditions? And I, and I think it would be great for maybe both of us to speak to those. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like right now for me, it's that trust is, is, is broken. And it, it, it speaks to the, the co comment you made around people profiting and benefiting from this moment of crisis. And, you know, I've been thinking a lot about the white arts. Let's focus in on the arts, like the white colleagues response to this moment is is quite challenging to trust and the thing i've been saying to folks uh, uh, i was speaking to a black female playwright who said she illuminated it illuminated it so clearly for me she said you know the thing about what happened to george floyd was not yeah the murder obviously is atrocious but what's crazy about it is that for almost nine minutes he had his knee the officer had his, his knee on on george floyd's neck and all around him were people of color saying, take your knee off his neck, please. You're gonna kill him, take your knee off his neck. And he didn't have to listen. He had his hands in his pocket. He had a stance in his body and he had supremacy in his eye. And the moment I feel that white people are missing is white people are angry for the murder because they know they would not commit murder. They know that that's an atrocity that should be vilified. It's, it's horrible. It's against the law. But what they don't see is the officer's arrogance. It's what's in his eye. That's what supremacy is, the feeling that you don't have to listen. And with all that's coming out right now in the arts, all of this info in the dressing room, all these things about structural racism in our community, it's not new. It's just that people didn't listen. White people didn't have to listen. And they have that arrogance. They have their hands in their pockets. And so the challenge I'm having is if we're truly in solidarity 
and you want to stand next to me or a black person or an indigenous person, then you have to see yourself as the enemy. And that's the piece that that is missing in the conversation, to see yourself in the police officer and not the protester. And that, for me, then we can start getting into truths. Then we can start getting into, well, then now who leads this conversation and who who's prepared for this conversation? Because I would say Black people, Indigenous people, racialized people have had to face this their whole lives. My parents dealt with that arrogance in this country. I grew up every day with it. And then, you know, from a structural point, if we're looking at leadership, that plays out in so many ways. If you look at Stratford in the dressing room, you'll see how it plays out in the acting community. But from a structural place, you know, it's the same as governments. We have funders, that's government policies that are are created to keep Black people, Indigenous people, and people of color small. You can't grow an institution. You can't, why do we have so few uh, leaders of color and institutions of color because there's been no money, there's been no infrastructure support. So that's a kind of way that we um, purposefully keep the community small and we keep leadership out. And it all comes from this not listening, this 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 continual pattern of not listening. And And right now, everyone's saying they're listening and I don't trust it. And I don't trust how you're listening or what you're listening to. And I'm concerned that the listening is opportunistic and a kind of rebrand that allows you to stay comfortable and reaffirm the power and privilege that you have. So I'm not a good person to disagree with you. (laughs) I know, I know. because I think it's in our nature as humans to want to um, survive and thrive and some of us to grow. Um, And I think that, um, and I think that survival ends up doing some um, not necessarily positive things when it comes to um, real conversation. in other words, you and I spoke the other night about like, well, what happens if all of the white leaders were to suddenly, you know, stop running theater companies, for example, or we could, you know, go into other, so stay in the theater, were they to stop doing that? Where, how come there is not like a long line of people uh, ready to step in? What is in the system that is making it still necessary, or so we think, this is part of it, like, or so we think, for that not to be possible? Like, what are the, the, the structural issues that are keeping listening within a tight framework um, that may actually be making change N- not tr- not truthful. Like when you say you don't trust it, like when it's actually m- maybe not making it truthful, it's more finding new language with which to speak speak about it. Um, and I and I think I'm just struck because Ken in the previous panel talked about how um, you know we think we have to do it within the structures, but we don't necessarily have to do it within the structures. And that becomes a really big question because I think. Fear tells us we have to do it within the structures. Fear tells us that um, we have to find ways to do it the way we've been doing it, but to do it with different people. So if we're doing it with different people, then why are we doing We're not doing it the way we were doing it. So things mm-hmm. have to change. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my wish is, and this is where it's, it's, is it an abandonment of my own privilege? And so my wish is that there was there was an that I could hear like let's do this let's work in this way and I I feel like um, Anthony just said and I'm sorry for taking from other people but Anthony just said flux like we're in this like do we like how do we how do we shift it so that we're actually moving forward or or is right now just about saying no we're not moving forward we're just in it and we're in despair and we're feeling messed up and so let's be in that. Well, so I think my response to that, it, it just tied into what you were saying about if all the white leaders were to step down, who would who would be the play, people to take their place? I think there's a twofold uh, challenging answer in that, that I've really pushed myself forward 
in, which is one, yes, the communities have not had the support and opportunities to really build a deep bench on one level, but on the other level, we're assuming that there are people who aren't ready. And there are people who've been doing this work, the specific work. And I mean, I know, I know, I know you're not necessarily implying that, but for me, I had to challenge myself that, you know, this moment, particularly I would say to women of color, black women and indigenous women and women of color have been dismissed time and time again when they speak up and when they speak out. And, you know, what would a world look like if they were, uh, if more opportunity was given in, in, the, in those scenarios? And, and I would say, in terms of leadership right now, something I heard uh, on theater communications group in the States, it was a young uh, black male artistic director was saying, you know, what this moment is showing us is how unqualified leadership is for this moment and how actually for years we've been told we're not qualified for these jobs, even though we definitely are. But for this moment, we, you are like the majority of white artistic leadership is unqualified. They don't have the language they don't have the experience and worse as we're seeing come out from all of the, in, in the dressing rooms, they cause harm. They continually cause harm because they don't understand the dynamics of race or um, care or racism and supremacy. And so one way I think in terms of how to answer the question, how can we be different? Well, can we, de can we not center this around a white experience? Can we not foresee a future that still has white people at the center of the fixing? Because, because the, the other thing is for me, white artists are the worst. White artists don't, have never affected any kind of change. So I was talking to a white artistic director the other day and he said to me, you know, don't you think, don't you see change? Like, don't you think that change has happened? And I said, what do you mean? He was like, well, like I see a lot more people of color and stuff on stage, like hasn't change happened? And I said, no, actually, no, hold on a second. Let's get the story straight. First of all, you can change the people, but you don't change the systems. So how does, how does an artistic director get support, an artistic director of color get the support they need to change the system, the, the system of white supremacy within an organization? But let's set that aside. 2016, Canada Council changed everything. For Why Not in particular, we actually were able to become a company, uh, a significant institution, because we they prioritized innovation, uh, inclusion, and international and non-venues, and money came into communities to address historical inequities. And people were mad. White people, a lot of institutions were mad about that. I had to speak at a committee in parliament for heritage to justify why that was important because a lot of institutions were upset. So yeah, a change was made, but there were still people who didn't want that. There were still white artists who were in the way of that. And then my kind of Trump point is if you would look specifically at Toronto, we have a three female artistic leaders of color. Nina Lee Aquino became the artistic director of Factory and she only got the job because Ken Gass got fired not because people wanted that change. And when she took the job, people hated her for it. They didn't want her to have it. People, critics, everyone still attacked her. Nobody wanted her to have that change, but she did it anyways. And she got that job. Wayne is the artistic director of Soul Pepper after Albert was taken out by a group of women in a coordinated effort to call him out for his sexual assault uh, allegations. And even still, people did not want that to happen. People were against that happening. Um, you know, the list goes on and on. I think that what, we're, what we see again in this moment is black people right now are marching in the streets, putting their lives on the line for a huge change. And I don't think I see enough white allies really getting behind this change. In fact, I see contraction. I see fear. I see people... Um, avoiding this conversation right now because they want to be seen as the good ones. And that to me is, is really scary. It's really scary because I don't, because it only centralizes themselves in this conversation again, and it allows them to be the power to fix it when they've never fixed it. I don't have a, 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 a moment in history where that's happened. So, you know, a couple of things. I mean, I can totally feel myself, you know, 
wanting to be like one of the good ones, like always, right? Like, oh, you know, like, you know, I want to be one of the good ones. Um, but I, but I do feel like the enemy, you know, I do actually. And I, and, and it's because I come from privilege and it's because I'm aware of my privilege and I'm, you know, I feel privileged. And so to feel that means I have to, personally, I feel that I have to work to acknowledge that and to do what I can to do good. Or as I like to say, to try to do more good than harm. But I have to acknowledge that in the landscape and particularly in this moment, I see my friends of color when they come on to a call or whatever, they count, right? And it's like, how many? And it's like, too many, you know? And I, I don't know what the answer is when suddenly, is there a moment where suddenly that's not the case? I don't know, but I know that right now it is the case. I know mm -hmm. that it is about like, where is my representation? Why is it happening in this way? What does change look like? Like, I'm so, I'm so aware of that. I also think that I'm, I'm, a, I'm fierce and I'm a wimp. I prefer not to be the head of a company. You know, because I can, I feel like I can do uh, things that I wouldn't be able to do. I feel like I can have freer conversations and that's wimpy. That's maybe not stepping up. I don't know, you know, but. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, you're again, like the cycles, I think are a really fascinating example of what someone can do on the inside. Um, you know, when I went on the inside of the institution, it wasn't as good. <laughs> So I feel like how great that you're able to do that. Um, and in that act, not, a, not everyone can get inside and, and be as effective as you've been. Um, it makes me think about uh, Clayton Thomas Muller, who we met in Banff. So he was an, he's an activist um, uh, uh, with an organization called 360 Degrees, right? 350.org. 350.org, yeah. an amazing human. And the, my, my, the real impression he left on me was that if we wanna talk about climate, it's an indigenous issue. It, it is an indigenous centered issue and that you can't move forward in anything really if you don't have us at the center. And that was really striking to me when I think about things like Extinction Rebellion, when I think about movements for climate justice that um, are missing that voice that, and, and on one hand, it's good. Like they're, they're, they're mobilizing a cause and they're activating a cause and, and it's an important one that affects all of us. But as you said at the beginning, it affects everyone differently. And how do we, how do we look to the leadership that is already there, that is in the community, that is, has a different relationship to these um, systems and situations. And I, for me, I think that's at least some start in addressing the system of supremacy now and acknowledging that also I but, but, but what is like what is the start what is the action in there when you I I think working to decentral I mean taking out uh the the white power to start so acknowledging uh a different perspective in leadership so um actually providing the resource and privileges that a come with a, like a major institution like so for example give uh, Native Earth Canadian Stages budget. What would, how would that change everything? That would take the power away from an institution and give it to another that has a, a direct, uh, so a, a direct and different though, experience. To challenge that, when you say give the, that those funds, who's giving those funds? So in an ideal world, it would be the white institution that would look deeply and listen deeply about their power and privilege like historically. A, right. Yeah. Maybe, I, look, I, I well, don't no, have I any mean, solution. I mean, yeah. I'm, interested, I'm interested in, in thinking about it in that way as opposed to it being like a Canada Council decision or a heritage decision that, that you know, because then it's still held in the same few people who are doing like what, doing good? Like doing like, I, it's, it's, it's more interesting to me to think about a conversation amongst theater companies where there's a real soul-filled exchange, conversation of exchange about that. I mean, that. I think, I, I mean, that would be amazing. I think that that would be, um, I, think, I think we're far away from that step because I still think we're not on the same page 
in our assessment and understanding of what white supremacy is and how that plays out in daily lives. But if we got there, you know, sign me up. I think that would be really interesting because then it would actually be acknowledging uh, all the harm that caused and, and the, the, the um, lack of water given to communities to actually grow, lack of support. You know, another thing I'll tell you this, I've, th I've been thinking about, so we can right now, there's a call to defund the police and, and provide police or provide that funds directly to the community. So one could say, let's defund the institution. Let's get the opera and the ballet to give their funds to native earth and obsidian and, you know, actually put it into the communities where, where, you know, where so many, so much work is done also. Like we have to look at these culturally uh, focused companies because they're working because the institution excluded them and they don't have the resource. What often happens is they'll develop artists, but those artists will go to Stratford. They'll go to Shaw because that's where the money is. That's where they can get jobs. That's where projects can happen because the community can't keep them. And then we see this cycle where they get harmed and there's constant harm and, and the cycle kind of continues. Um, I lost my train of thought there. Sorry with uh, maybe this Oh, de defund the institution. Or secondly, let's look at something like this. What would happen if we look at the movements that are happening right now about eliminating racist statues? So they're tearing down statues of slave owners and throwing them in the river. What if we dissolve organizations? What if we address the historical legacy of some organizations and the future legacy of those organizations and we rebuild? What would that look like? What would that world be? I, I, I haven't thought that through yet, but like, I look to what's happening outside and I say, well, those are things we haven't tried <laughs> because we've been here before and we've tried things before. I mean, and you know, please, please, please. Well, I, was, I mean, it's, it's tied, I think, in a lot of ways to uh, money and, uh, the, you know, supremacy of money that sort of keeps this structure intact and um, resources and the extraction of resources, be they, um, from the earth, be they women's bodies, be they any number of different um, elements that you know exist in the on this planet. But I think, um, you know, last year uh, when we met in Banff, you know, every person to 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 a speaker who who knows what is going on with regards to different elements around climate change spoke to the system uh, of capitalism and neoliberalism and how it is absolutely tied to this ongoing kind of. Um, uh, demise of uh, the planet, of sustainability, of the air that we breathe, the water that's accessible, all of it's tied to the monetary system that we are all in some ways implicated in, whether or not we choose to be or not, right now we're caught in the clutches of that. And so what's been so mind blowing about at least the first three weeks of COVID was that suddenly, you know, all the jokes and op-eds were like, hey, everyone's a socialist all of a sudden, like, wow, it's possible to feel like, you know, and of course that passed very quickly, but there was this, you know, this brief window where these massive, massive governmental shifts that everyone said could never happen and made me personally think, well, then how the hell are we going to do anything showed me that in fact they can, those massive things can happen. Um, and I guess, Part of my part of my curiosity ongoing is how how do we make the massive things happen? I know the small things have to. I know it's like defunding, you know, this this idea to defund uh, certain cultural institutions. Great in the in the cosmology of all the institutions. Um, does that do then does then theater do then the arts you know do they get relegated to a lack of import? Does the the ground does the water do the do the rivers do they get lowered in impact or import because the very wealthy can live above you know those those pure resources? I, I have some real questions about the. Mm -hmm the interrelationship between really all things in this question, between equitable treatment of all human beings. Um, and maybe that means what is perceived to be less equal treatment of certain people who've had a lot more good stuff for many, you know, hundreds of years, but still something of a power shift that is not just relegated to the theater, but has to do with the way in which we live on this planet mm -hmm. and the way in which we center ourselves as humans within the story of the planet, which is not the story of this planet. 
you know, there's, there's, so I, I don't want to spin off because I know that a really important part for you is that we stick within this question of how to have a conversation about the climate at this point in time in North America when people are dying and black bodies in particular and indigenous bodies in particular are being um, completely um, devalued. And so well, I, yeah. and, and then to tie to the arts that we're, we're talking about the devaluing and the dehumanizing of black indigenous and racialized people in, in our community and with our friends. Like that's the, the hiccup of all this is these are my friends. And when we talk about big sweeping change, I agree with you, like we can imagine, wow, how surprising and how quickly the government responded to COVID and it's possible, big things are possible. The challenge I have in this moment is we don't agree on the small things. Mm -hmm. We don't agree on how upsetting it is to be told you must wear this wig color because your skin looks a certain way. We don't think that's a real thing. We don't, we don't agree that that we don't all agree that that's a real psychological impact that has ramifications. We don't, we don't agree on when you tell me, Oh, that's a bad idea. Like you're constantly rejecting my idea, but liking your white friend's idea. Like we don't agree on those systems of dehumanization. We don't agree on the things that I see every day and that my colleagues and I cry about behind closed doors. We don't agree about that power structure. You know, um, so it's hard to talk in sweeping change when we can't, race is the one that's the fucking shitty one because, because me too, we all agree. I mean, there are those who don't, but we, we can all get behind that because we, there are things about that that are undeniable. There's still things about race where we still need to force ourselves to say, I believe you. We don't, but we dismiss and don't believe the realities of the impact of, of how people are treated and, and our friends. You know, I, I didn't tell you the story. On a fucking Zoom call, my friend, my white male artistic director friends were getting together on a Zoom call and we're trying to do good and they treat me a certain way. And I tell them that they're racist and I don't want to be part of these systems. And then I have to take care of them for three hours to help them understand why they, I'm calling them racist. We don't agree. They, they, they refuse to see this moment. So it's hard. I mean, the climate, we all agree with, but, we, but we, we're not experiencing it the same way. Maybe we don't all agree. I don't know what the fuck. All I can say what? is I don't know if we have a shared analysis of the situation and I, I see a lot of refusal to accept uh, complicity. And that speaks to myself too. I ha I've admitted complicity to white supremacist um, values that I've done because um, I can do that <laughs> in that I'm a brown person. I can still be part of the system because that's what I was taught. Yeah, so, that, that system is yeah. that system is pervasive, and and I hear you because you know it's yeah. easy for me to go to the system because it's also how my my brain works, and I think about structures and how they impact so many things and policy and how it implicates you know so many decisions without people even knowing that they were actually taking you know they thought they were taking their own decision. It's like no, actually, there's certain ways that we're made to think. But I also feel um, and I and I hear you when you say we don't agree, and so. Uh, I, I know that I want to, I know that I uh, personally, I know that I'm a person who wants to, that I'm a person that um, is interested in that. And that is also a privilege because I can be, I can say, oh, well, I want to. It's like, yeah, but what if you don't have any choice, Sarah? <laughs> which, you know, so many of my friends don't feel that they have the choice. So I also understand that. And I think it comes back to this positioning of the enemy and um, the enemy and the friend and, and why ally is such a hard word right now, because mm -hmm. it's, it's, I think we all want to be the, the good ones, but what does it mean to admit that we're not? What does it mean to admit that um, whether we grew up in a system where we couldn't recognize that we're not, where, you know, I mean, for me, 
the, the profound changes that I feel that I've, I've had the, again, the, the, the privilege of coming to in my later years because of the people who have allowed me to meet them. Um, do I fear that had I not met them that I may not have changed and therefore mm. not even have ever noticed that there was something that I needed to change? That's a really tricky one. I don't know. I, I, feel, I feel fortunate in that regard. But are there still so many places where I think I could show up to something and feel like I'm showing up in the right way? Uh, yeah. Well, how do we do it? How do we, how do we, how do we, is this conversation, is this conversation meaningful? Is it performative? Is it meaningful? Is it rigorous? Do conversations have to be rigorous? Um, I think they have to be rigorous. Yeah. And I think they have to be of a certain level. Um, I mean, I think I feel, <laughs> I feel we've managed to take the performance out of this by not making it a panel, but who knows, maybe we're, we know we're being watched. Um, yeah, I don't know. I know that you were, <clears throat> you know, one of my, we're good friends. And we've had a lot of really fun times and we've talked about work and sort of, you know, overlap. But I, I know uh, that the sound of your voice, the st stricture, the, the, uh, the hurt and the rage was so total um, when we first started talking um, around this issue. Because as you said, like, you know, at that point, it, you said they're all my friends. Like they're all my friends, meaning my friends, not your friends, my friends. And that your fear or your feeling, and maybe both, was that um, we couldn't be, we couldn't feel what you were feeling. And I think, in in a lot of ways, that's why this conversation came about. Mm -hmm. Because you said you couldn't trust. And yeah. And I, yeah, and I'm appreciative for that. And, and I would say the process of this actually has made me feel a bit, a bit more trusting um, of certain individuals. But I, I, I think in terms of demanding rigor of the conversation, this is why you're unique. And I said this to you on the phone, like in 2016, we had this gathering of artistic directors of color from around the world that Sarah was part of. And um, at the time you were talking about the difficulty you were having with language and how language was changing on you and you were failing at every step because language was changing. And I didn't actually understand what you meant until like this moment when I realized, oh, all this language that I'd learned over the years about microaggressions, systemic racism, all this stuff that most of our colleagues are underqualified for at this moment. Um, you know, engaging in the level of that and doing the reading and the, and the thinking is, is so important for trust in this conversation so that we can be on a level and have some understanding of, of how, sh how messy this all is. Like it's, it's so messy. I, I said to someone the other day, I, I wish we could go back to lying because I was so good at it. I was so good at it. I didn't let, and I didn't need any of you all to know how much I was affected by this. I've had, I've had tons of friends who've come to me and said, you know, are, are you okay? Are you okay? I didn't know you were so sad before. <laughs> it's like, we all are. I mean, I mean, and I have a different experience than black people do than indigenous people do. I have, I have privilege of, so many degrees because people listen to me because I'm not threatening. And, you know, my regret, my regret when I think deeply about supremacy, my regret is that I've upheld white supremacy by valuing the comfort of white people 
over black and indigenous and racialized folks. It's so many times I've spoken truth to power. Don't get me wrong. My whole time with Albert was truth to power and getting silence. But for the most part, I, that I, that I've upheld that comfort comfort. And that's the thing I'm asking folks to challenge and myself to challenge is that comfort, that, that ease of with this conversation, the ease of saying I'm listening is so false. You got to listen. It's got to hurt. If it doesn't hurt, then you're not listening and you're not looking at the right thing. And I think it's the same. That's true. I think with climate, like, we have to face ourselves. That was the other thing about BAM. Or working with David Suzuki, you know, um, that's, it, this is a moral issue. We have to all do face ourselves and our choices and live with that. And, and the challenge with this moment is the lies are being exposed. We can't lie in the same way. I don't have the heart for it. And now it's all out. <laughs> um, You know, so some, I don't know what to do. Yeah. Some years ago, I was at um, Talking Stick in Vancouver, and uh, an artistic associate, associate artistic director like me, from uh, he was from the Guthrie, and um, he was the as he sort of identified himself the associate artistic director of color uh, at the Guthrie, and he was um, really critical of the. Um, of the structure and how things work there. And he was really, really clear. And somebody asked him about that. And he said, oh, listen, I, I like everybody there. It's not personal. It feels personal, but my job is to be critical. Like that's, the, that's my job. And I, uh, I took a lot from that because he, he wasn't saying, I don't want this position. I like, he said, I like that position. I really do. I'm, I'm really happy to have this position. But I think the way in which I got it, the way in which I'm expected to behave as a result of having it, you know, all those things, I'm going to be in conversation with now that I'm there doing it. Um, and I was really struck. I was struck by that. But of course, you know, lately, I think these, in, in certainly this last like couple of months, what's been really clear is that's an additional job that he's doing. Mm -hmm. That's not actually the job that, you know, that he would be doing at that time at that theater if he were just just hired to be like a director, right? Mm -hmm. He's there mm -hmm. to have to do the fight, to do the struggle, to do the whatever. And, I, and what I hear is people saying, what I hear is people saying, we've been struggling, it's your turn to struggle. Like, that's what I hear. And um, I think that's true. But I feel that to be true. I feel mm -hmm. that I'm able to, because of how I was brought up, because of where I uh, uh, grew up, that I'm able that I can walk away, or I could walk away, mm. and I can't walk away from my moral connection to this question about the climate. I can't. Mm -hmm. I can't walk away from my friends many of whom are not like me. I can't walk away because I'm a woman and because I'm queer. I can't walk away because I don't want to walk away. But the reason not to trust, I think, is that those are words unless I keep doing, unless I keep doing mm -hmm. what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. That was something, uh, so David Suzuki has a very good friend named Miles Richardson. He's an indigenous activist, water protector, land protector. And uh, I met him when we did our workshop in Vancouver. And he said to me, he goes, you know, when I met David first, I thought he was an asshole. He just showed up at these protests saying that he was supporting indigenous people and uh, fighting for the land. And I thought he was an asshole. Then I saw him again. Then I saw him again, and then he just kept coming. I still think he's a bit of an asshole, but he's a good guy. <laughs> it's true, it's the commitment, right? It's the commitment, and and because this is gonna be, I talked to the wonderful, amazing Karen Robinson, and I was like, help me lady, 
you got to help me. We've been here. I'm, I am so sad. I know, you know, this time she was like, this is a moment of moments in moments, you know, this revolutions are long and they're messy. And it was helpful to hear because it was like, um, this is going to be a long haul and I just want to be sure we do it right. And we do it together. Um, so let's keep showing up, you know, like, I mean, that's all we can really do right now. I, I don't know. I, I feel at a loss because I don't feel we have a structure for this conversation. I feel as a community in Toronto, as a country community in the arts, I don't feel that we have a structure for this. And that's why, uh, uh, I, that's, that's one of my concerns, you know, with, with climate, at least there's a, there's an understanding of what the conversation is. There's organization, there's mo movements, there's people who are organizing. This one, uh, while, while, you know, the, in the green room is happening, I feel like the, the, I don't see the, I see, I see black people organizing. I see indigenous people organizing. I see racialized people organizing. We're having conversations every fucking day. Every day I'm on a call with a group and we're not talking about programming. We're not talking about the work we're going to do. We're not talking about the shows, what artists we can hire. We're talking about caring for each other and what are we going to do? And I don't see that. I don't see that coordinated effort. I, Cause I've been to the meetings of white artistic directors. I, the only thing I could say when I left was to say, I am appalled at the level of discourse you're having. This isn't good so enough. So Ravi, uh, yeah, we're appalled, at time. appalled at the level of discourse. <laughs> we don't have structures for this conversation and we need structures for this conversation. And we're in a period of huge change and um, it's been good talking to you. It's been great talking to you. I, I really, again, I appreciate it. Um, making the space and the time for this. Um, if anybody didn't get anything out of it, at least I did. Thank you. Thanks everyone for listening. Thank you. Thanks. I think we're gonna leave this conversation and we're gonna be back in a little bit to talk about how to change the economy. So maybe there'll be some insights. <laughs> <laughs> Do we just stay? There. I guess so until- This is that part of the show the when happens. the credits roll. Yeah, yeah. Well.